That's right. We're on live. We're going to get this thing done one way or another. What's up to y'all? As we look into Isaiah 54, uh, now he is writing to the nation of Israel, but he is also speaking into our lives today. And if you will remember, when we finished up Isaiah 53, we saw the rejection of the Messiah, Israel's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they're waiting for a Messiah. Now, he's already come. He came 2,000 years ago, Jesus born of a virgin, lived a perfect sinless life, and then one day he went to the cross and died for the sins of the world, and he died. He rose again the third day. He's alive today. Israel did not accept him at that time as their Messiah. They're waiting on a Messiah, and they will one day accept a false Messiah, the Antichrist, who will come on the scene at some point, we don't know when, after the rapture of the church, and he will fool Israel, if you will. He will deceive Israel into signing a seven-year covenant or peace treaty with them. And in the middle of that seven-year period, he will break that covenant. He will break that treaty, go into a rebuilt temple, and proclaim himself to be God, demand to be worshipped. And, of course, at that point, Israel, Revelation 12, will flee into a place we think it might be Petra can't be dogmatic about that but it's possible but she will flee into the wilderness and God will take care of Israel for three and a half years then Jesus will return with his saints you and me if we're saved I'm saved I got saved 38 years ago he will return with his saints to rule and reign not only over Israel but over the entire earth and at that point Israel will accept Christ as their Messiah, they will embrace him, and, and it's at this point, Isaiah 54, that we pick up our study because um, this is talking about the future of Israel, and not just Israel, folks, and, and here again, we know he's writing to Israel, but what happens to Israel will eventually happen to the entire world. God sent his son through the Jewish nation. And, and you know, I'll just pause here and just say, I am convinced that's one, probably the reason that the world hates Israel. You know, the devil hates the Jewish people. He does. He hates, now he hates all people, but he especially hates the Jew because it was through the line of the Jews that Jesus came and redeemed provided redemption for the entire world. Every person living, every person who has lived, <clears throat> every person who will be born. Now, not everybody will accept that, unfortunately, but it's available to all. And I'm convinced that's one of the reasons why there's so much anti-Semitism in the church today. And we have this replacement theology baloney that's going around today. And the devil has convinced everybody that Israel's through God has no more plan for Israel. Well, I think if you read Isaiah 54, you'll have a, a better view of this because we find that God does have a plan. He says in verse 1, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more, notice this, are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife saith the Lord. He continues here. Now, in verse 2, he, well, in verse 1, he tells them to sing. So we know we're talking about the beginning of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not talking about the current age, because my friend, there's not a whole lot of singing going on in Israel. I'll just tell you that right now. Not a whole lot of singing. There's a whole lot of confusion right now. <coughs> I saw yesterday where Prime Minister Netanyahu, who was one of the greatest and I'll just go on record and say this. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was one of the greatest prime ministers Israel has ever had. 
he did more for Israel in 12 years than a lot of leaders have done in years because he loved Israel, he loved his people, and he was not willing to compromise. And the New World Order, <clears throat> I'll just say this, and I'll probably get flagged for it, and I don't really care anyway, so it don't really matter. Uh, the New World Order had to get rid of two men. They had to get rid of Donald Trump because Donald Trump stood with Israel and he proclaimed something that God already made known, and that was the fact that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, and he stood with Israel. Uh, and, of course, the New World Order had to get rid of Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, they've succeeded in getting rid of both men. Now, these men weren't perfect. Let me just say that right off the bat. We don't worship them. We know they are men. They're not perfect. God used them for his purpose. So... Now, is God upset about all of that this morning? No, God is not upset. God works his plan. He, if you study the Old Testament, if you study the Bible, you know that God brings men, puts them in his place where he wants them to be. When he's through with them, he takes them away, puts them somewhere else. And I believe that's what's happened here. Now, what will happen with this new fella who is... Uh, let me explain to you what has happened in Israel. Just I'll, I'll just take a brief break from this text here. And what has happened? You've got an ultra-conservative party in Israel who did something very unusual. They aligned themselves with the most liberal parties of Israeli politics. They got together and said, we want to form a government, all for one purpose. They wanted to get rid of Netanyahu, and they did that. And... And they will pass laws. I guarantee you over the next few years, they're going to pass laws in such a way that Prime Minister Netanyahu cannot ever run personally again for Prime Minister of Israel. They're going to fix it to where he can no longer be. And it's going to happen in this country too. Uh, the, the left wing in this country will fix it to where certain people will not be able to run for president again. And... Uh, and so they're, they're going to have their way. And that's fine. They're going to have their way. And that's okay because, hey, God has a plan. And folks, those of you who are saved and you love the Lord, you love his word, I promise you things are going to get worse. They're not going to get better till Jesus comes, okay? They're not going to get better. The world is going to get worse and worse. And the new world order is going to take over. It's in the process of doing that now. May I say to you, there is a shadow world government right now. You say there's a world government? Well, it's not officially in place yet, but I'm telling you folks, it is moving right along. You say, Pastor Joe, how do you know that? Well, let me just, okay. Uh, all world bodies have to do, okay? All world organizations have to do is make a statement and policy is created. For example, all the world, world Health Organization has to do is hold a news conference and say, we have a pandemic, and guess what? Hello, there's a pandemic. And all the world bodies have to do is say, this is law, and guess what? This is law. Something is law. They're going to pass a new ordinance, pass a new policy worldwide. Folks, it's coming. I'm just telling you, the world government is coming. Okay? Now, I don't know how this is going to how we're going to transition from individual nations to the, the world government as the Bible describes it, okay? Maybe the rapture will cause that, okay? Maybe the rapture will cause such confusion that all the world leaders will get together and say, man, there's so much confusion, we got to get together. Or maybe they'll say, wow, we got rid of those Christians and Bible bangers. They won't say that, actually. Um, but, but they'll say, we got rid of all those, you know, people... And uh, now we have our, you know, world and we can do what we want to with it. You know, it, it could be the rapture is going to somehow bring about the fulfillment, the full um, blooming, if you will, of the world government. But it's waiting now. It's in the shadows, I guarantee you. It's moving along and they're putting it together. The devil is doing his work, I'll tell you what. But you know what? God's doing his work too. And if you know the book of Job, we went through the book of Job several months ago. You know that the devil, Satan, can do nothing except God gives him permission. So, folks, I just want you to know, everything that's happening in our world today is happening by God's appointment, okay? So don't be upset. Don't be afraid. 
one one day Jesus is going to come the trumpet's going to sound and if you're saved you're going to be caught up to meet him in the air and I thank the Lord for that and so we won't have to worry about the world government and all that garbage and all that that's going around we don't have to worry about that okay so if I were you if you're not saved I'd get saved today you say why today well the Bible says today's a day of salvation now is the accepted time I don't know when Jesus is coming so while there's still time I believe I'd get saved if I were you okay but here's what's happening the world is trying to get Israel to to lessen their territory to make narrow their territory. The world is doing everything it can. You know, uh, all of the UN infidels, you know, they're wanting Israel to go back to the 1967 borders and all that junk, you know. Hey, listen, they took that land back because it was given to them by God. And and they said, it's ours, we're taking it. Biblically, it's ours. And, and the infidel United Nations says, no, you gotta go back to 1967 borders, blah, blah, blah. Well, in the kingdom age, here's what's going to happen. God's going to have a different message than the UN. The UN will be roasted in hell in the kingdom age, by the way. There won't be no UN in the kingdom age. All that will be done away with. All the world government will be gone. Antichrist will be gone. Here's what it says in verse 2. Enlarge. Oh, really? Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations spare not lengthen not notice this lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes in other words israel make your tent larger make your land greater now if you look at a bible map you know that israel owns today god gave them the title deed they own everything from the euphrates river that's in iraq westward over to the uh, Mediterranean Sea. They own all of that today. If they wanted to, they could legally, well, biblically, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's the law, okay? They could go over there and take all that land and be legal about it, and God wouldn't say a word about it. Now, the UN might. They might have something to say. Of course, we don't care what they say anyway, but all we care about is what God thinks here on Verse by Verse. But they own all of that. Well, one day they're going to have it, folks. They are going to have it, okay? For thou shalt break forth. Now watch this. Thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. And watch this. Make the desolate cities to be inhabited. So they're going to inherit the Gentiles. In other words, in the kingdom age, the Jews, they're going to have their land. Christ will reign over not only the Jews, but over the Gentiles, the whole world. That's what we're trying to say. Fear not. Now, they're fearing today, but he says in the kingdom age, in the future, and he's telling us today, fear not. Why? For thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded. For thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt, notice this, forget the shame of thy youth. God says, I'll wipe it away, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. God says, you're going to forget all of your past. I'm going to wipe it clean. You won't remember that. For, watch this, verse 5, thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Now, here again, Israel today is not looking to God, okay? I'm just telling you, they're not looking to God for redemption. They're looking, well, right now they're looking for, you know, themselves. But they're they're waiting for a Messiah, a false Messiah, and they're going to accept him. But one day they'll accept Jesus as their Messiah. Now watch this. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. Now, uh... In the kingdom age, there won't be any idolatry, okay? In the kingdom age, there's only going to be one Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And he meant it, folks. And there is only one God. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, I, you know, that's okay. That's your choice. But I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And here on verse by verse, we tell you what the Bible says, okay? And 
He's the God of the whole earth. Now he's the God of the whole earth today, although men don't accept that, and he'll be the whole and he'll be the God of the whole earth during that age as well. He says, For the Lord hath called thee as okay, so he's comparing it here, as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast notice this, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. He's making a comparison. I've called you as I'm comparing you to a wife. He's not saying you are a wife. He's saying I'm making a comparison. God speaks. God speaks in language that we can understand. That's why he does this, okay? Now, he says, for a small moment have I forsaken thee. Now, you can understand this because in 70 AD, the Jews rejected their, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in 33 AD, when Jesus died, they rejected their Messiah, and in 70 AD, God said, okay, I'm going to disperse you. Now, some people have a problem with that today. Some Orthodox Jews and some Jews that are unorthodox, as far as, you know, just in Jews only in heritage, they are upset because they say, well, God has forsaken us, you know, then how can we believe in a God that forsook us? And notice what he says here. He does say, I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies, for a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Okay, let me read verse 7 again so we can make sure it's clear. He says, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I, in the future, will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, okay? Will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy, uh, thy Redeemer. So, um, now, we take the Bible literally here on verse by verse, okay? We're not going to allegorize it and all that stuff. When God says everlasting, that's exactly what he means, amen? And he says with everlasting kindness. Look at verse 9. For this is now. He's going to compare it again. He's going to use an illustration that we can understand. Okay, so if you know your Bible, <clears throat> which I strongly encourage you to, to study, you will know what he's talking about here. Verse 9. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. Okay, so God says, just like I made a covenant with Noah, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Watch what he says. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. So God is saying, I'm going to take you in again. And I, you know, I'm not through with you. So if you're in that camp this morning that believes that that God is through with Israel, that the church has replaced Israel, and uh, you know, if, if you believe that, my friend, you're in error. I love you this morning, but I'm just telling you. Morning, Anthony. How you doing, buddy? And I'm just telling you, if if you're in that camp this morning, understand Isaiah 55 has a different message, has a different message than that. He says, I, I you know. I will turn to you with everlasting kindness forever and ever. Now, watch verse 10. He says, For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed. And of course, if you read the book of Revelation, you know that the type, typography of the earth is going to be changed dramatically during that age. He says, All this is going to happen, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. If you are Jewish this morning, listen, I'm, I'm telling you, Jesus is the one you need to be turning to. He is the one who's going to redeem Israel one day. Jesus, turn to him. Turn to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are Jewish, let me just say this to you. Jesus fulfilled in his first coming every prophecy of the Old Testament regarding his first coming. There are hundreds of them. And just as he fulfilled the first coming prophecies, he will also fulfill some of the prophecies we just read in his second coming. Jewish friend, you can trust Jesus, your Messiah. He is the one who came. He died on a cross for you 2,000 years ago. He shed his blood for you. And if you will come, and even if you're not Jewish, if you're Gentile, he will redeem you this morning. You say, well, Pastor Joe, how can I get saved? 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And as a bonus, he wants to save your household too. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And that's what Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer there in the book of Acts. And it's as simple as ABC. We say this every week. And verse 11, O thou afflicted. Okay, so Israel has been, is afflicted. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, uh, and not comforted. He says, Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair, uh, with fair colors. Now, this could be a reference to the beautiful future, yet future, new Jerusalem that's going to be built after the kingdom age. When I say kingdom age, I mean by that the thousand year reign of Christ and then on into eternity. Okay, his kingdom will have no end. It will last for 1,000 years and then of course the great white throne judgment of all the lost and then the heavens and the earth will be destroyed, will be burned up and then he'll create new heavens and new earth. Revelation 21 and that will last forever and forever and forever. Amen. And I'll tell you what, that kingdom, it'll be a wonderful place to live. And so this could be what he's talking about here. He, he could be talking about the new Jerusalem with colors. Uh, now watch this. And lay thy foundations with sapphires. Okay, so this is some of the rocks that's used, that are used in Revelation 21 to describe the new city. He says, and I will make thy windows uh, as, as agates and thy gates. All right of carbuncles. Now, he's just describing here. I'm not going to read the rest of verse 12 uh, about all these stones. Um, notice what he says in verse 13. What's going to happen to children in the kingdom age? There will be children in the kingdom age. There will be abundant children in the kingdom age, a thousand year reign of Christ upon this earth. Notice it's vastly different than today of our world. Now, there are those who believe that we're in the kingdom age now. I have no idea where they get that because I'll tell you what, as I read the scriptures, guess what? I'm not seeing too much of, of what's going on in the kingdom age today. But notice what he says will happen to children in the kingdom age. And all thy children shall be taught, hello, shall be taught what? Of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. You know what? We could spend the next hour talking about this one. You know why our children, I love you this morning. I'm going to say some things that are going to, well, you just need to hear them, okay? You know why our children are not at peace today? I'll tell you why. It's because they're not being taught the Bible in school. You know, one woman, now I'm not anti-woman. I happen to be married to one, so I'm not anti-woman, but it just happened to be a woman. Her name was Madeline Murray O'Hare single-handedly got rid of the Bible out of our public schools in this country back in the 60s. And they got rid of prayer a year later. And, uh, and you know what? Ever since then, ever since they got rid of the Bible and prayer out of public schools, then our children have been less and less at peace every year. And are you going to sit there and try to tell me that your children, and, and I say your children, I don't necessarily mean your particular children who live in your home, but I mean, the children of our age today, are they living at peace? Okay, so let's talk about how they're living. Well, let's see. There are children who are living in cities, and they walk out, and they may end up in a drive-by shooting. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Our children are going out, and they don't know if, if they're going to be picked up off the street by some pedophile who wasn't taught the Bible, and he wasn't taught right from wrong when he was a kid and growing up about morals. Oh, really? We're in the kingdom age? Oh, okay. Uh, so, you're, so you're saying we shouldn't teach the Bible to children in public schools? Oh, really? Now we have a generation or two of people who have grown up without the light. And how are they living? How are they living? Children are not at peace. In fact, children in the womb are not even at peace today because we're taught today in our schools. It starts in the schools, folks. I love you. It starts in the schools. It starts at home. It starts in the schools. And the children, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. The children of the 60s were the parents of the 80s. All right? Children of the 70s were the parents of the 90s. Okay? They were not taught the Bible, generally speaking. The children of the 80s were the parents of the 2000s. 
Now watch this. The children that are born in the 90s, several generations down the road, who were the children of the 70s, guess what? We're not taught the scriptures. And I'm just trying to weave a web this morning of generational information. I'm giving you generational information to teach you, try to show you that for years, the Bible has been thrown out and we had now have two or three generations that are not living at peace and children even in the womb are not safe. They're not at peace today because a woman can go down the street from her house to an abortion clinic and have that children, uh, have that child, I'm sorry, have that child killed and the defenseless little babies, they're not at peace this morning. The children living outside the womb are not at peace. I wonder why. Well, my friend, in the kingdom age, they will be taught. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord. So are you saying we should teach our kids the Bible? Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. And that's, uh, that's the answer. Okay. And great shall be the peace of thy children. You want your kids to live at peace? Raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And fathers, I'm going to tell you something. It is not the school's job to educate your children. Now, having said that, you may send your kid to school. And I'm not saying you should homeschool all of your children, although that's not a bad idea these days, I will admit. That's not a bad idea. But I am saying, if you do send your kids to school, you need to make sure you know what your kids are learning. Okay? Make sure you know what's in the curriculum. You know, I, last year, let me just say this. Last year, um, when the you know, virus was going around and people were getting sick and they had to stay home and all that, they had school online. Over in Tennessee, uh, just west of my state, Virginia, they, uh, the school systems over there tried to get a ordinance or uh, policy, I guess you could say, not an ordinance, passed, whereby the parents could not watch what their children were learning even at home. And there's a reason for that. The school system doesn't want parents to know what they're teaching the kids because if they knew, because what was happening, parents were looking in on the kids learning and they were beginning to realize, wait, what are our kids learning? What in the world are they teaching my children? What were they teaching my kids while they were in school? Now they're in my house. They're being taught this stuff. You know, they're being taught that, you know, God is bad. The Bible's bad. They're being taught that America's bad. It was a bad idea. Now, folks, America is not a perfect country, okay? America made some real serious mistakes uh, in its inception and, and all of that. America was started by imperfect men. I understand that, okay? We did some pretty dumb things back in those days. We're doing some pretty dumb things today. We're not perfect. But I'm going to tell you what. What I would suggest to you this morning, if you don't like America, then... Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you. I mean that with all my heart. If you don't like, I'm, uh, hey, today's flag day. And I should have had a flag here in the office. I don't have one here right now. I should have had a flag in the background. And thank God for America. Thank God for the, the flag. And I, I tell you what, if you don't like America, then there are several hundred other countries. Well, there's about 200 other countries in the world that you can go live in. Okay, and you are free to leave if you wish. And if you don't like the country, then you don't have to stay here. Okay, and I, I don't, and um, there's nothing wrong with that. Our country's not perfect, but I'll tell you what, there are people that are trying to get to it. Must not be too bad, amen. There are a lot of people flocking to this country, and so I'm just saying, okay, in righteousness, verse 14 shalt thou be established. The kingdom age is going to be a righteous age. Okay? Thou shalt be far from the oppression, for thou shalt not fear. And, watch this, from terror. Oh, we have terror today. But in that day, they're going to be far from terror, for it shall not come near thee. The kingdom age is going to be a peaceful age to live in. Can't wait to get there. Can't wait till Jesus comes. That's going to be so exciting. And I know some people, they say, well, you know, you pre-trib people, you're escapists, and you want to escape. And you know what? I plead guilty to that because I read the book. I know what's coming in the tribulation period. I don't want to be here. If you want to be here, help yourself. Okay? Verse 15, 
Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. But not by me, whosoever shall shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. If you try to attack Israel in that day, you're going to get smacked down. And I, and I would say even today, listen, there is a covenant. It's called the Abrahamic Covenant. It's in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And God made it very clear uh, to every world leader, including the current ones, by the way, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee. And you know what? If you know your history, <clears throat> if you know your history, listen, you know that all people who have tried to hurt Israel through the years, through the hundreds and thousands of years, if they've tried to hurt God's people, they've gotten smacked down every time. Ask Haman, uh, ask Haman what happened, and you'll find that, oh, Haman, he ended up on the end of a rope in Esther. Ask Saddam Hussein what he tried to do to Israel. And guess where he ended up? On the end of a rope in 2006. Ask Adolf Hitler where he ended up when he tried and, and when he succeeded in killing six million Jews and he tried to exterminate the entire Jewish race. And well, I think we know his end. And I, I tell you what, you don't hurt God's people, my friend. You don't do it. And God said it's not going to happen without consequence. He says, Behold, I have created, I've created a smith that bloweth, notice this, bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth, bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created, um, I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon, he says, this is for Israel and for God's people. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment. Notice this, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. And today, as I sit here before you today, I am righteous, not because of my good works. I am righteous before the throne of God. And you say, well, Pastor Joe, how can you make a statement like that? Because of the precious blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I need to read that song on here next time. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I'll tell you what, if you're going to be forgiven of your sins today, if you're going to be righteous before the throne of God, it's going to be because of the blood of Jesus that washes you clean today. And my friend, you can be clean. Now, in that day, chapter 55, he continues here. And let me ask you a question. I taught on this yesterday in our local church uh, here where I live. And how many of you went to the grocery store this past week and you, you paid money for food? And well... All of you know that food has gone up. Everything's gone up. Building materials have gone up. My son wants to build a house, but he says, Dad, I can't do it now. It just costs too much. I'm kind of waiting for, for prices to fall for building material. It may or may not. I hope it does. But he says, you know, I just can't do it now. And, um, well, everything's gone up. Well, Pastor Joe, in the kingdom age, when Jesus comes to rule the earth, what will our bill be at the grocery store? The Bible has the answer. Are you ready? Here it is. Verse 1, Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money. Uh-oh, I don't have any money. Well, he says, come. If you don't have any money, come. Come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money. Here's the price. And without price. In other words, in the kingdom age, your grocery bill is going to be zero. The economy of the kingdom age is going to be much different than the economy of our day today. And it'll be a vastly different world to live in. Now, he asks a question in verse 2 that I think is pertinent for our day today. You know, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's a fact. What you spend your money on is what's in your heart. 
You say, Pastor Joe, can you tell what's in a man's heart? Well, I can't see the heart, but I'll tell you what, if you show me his checkbook, show me his credit statement, that'll tell me a lot about his heart. Did you know that? And Jesus made that statement. I didn't say that. He did. So talk to him about that. Well, in verse 2, he asks a question. He says, Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken or listen diligently unto me. I, I think I realize now what's happened. Somebody told me last night that I was really messing up on some of the scriptures I was reading. I think I understand what's happened. Because what I do when I read the King James Version, I will read a word, and if I can figure out a better word to say, then I will, like, for example, I, I will say, hearken. When I say hearken, immediately after that, I will say listen. All right, so that's supposed to be in parentheses, okay? So I'm just trying to help you understand. Uh, hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. Okay, so God implies here, he says, eat that which is good. That means, you know, in some cases, we're eating some things that are bad, okay? And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Okay, so God is saying, why are you spending you know, why are you spending your money for that which doesn't satisfy? And, and, and you know, we human beings are really uh, creatures of habit, aren't we? We buy something and we think it'll satisfy us, and it does for a while. And two days later, a week later, we need something else, something bigger. And so we go, we buy that. And friends, that's how we go in debt. You know, people buy things to, to try to make them happy. Pretty soon they've got a credit bill that's way out of whack and they're in debt up to their eyeballs. And listen, there's no reason for it. And you realize you're not satisfied anyway. And then you got all this debt to pay off, you labor. No wonder people have to work three and four jobs at a time. Now I'm not saying if you work three or four jobs, you're wrong. I'm not saying that, don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying, evaluate your life and ask the question, okay, am I spending my money on things that I don't need? Can I cut somewhere in my budget? Are there some things that I don't need? Okay. Um, we don't have cable TV here. We don't have satellite TV. Why? Is it wrong necessarily? Well, no. But we don't need it, my friend. And I'm not giving them $120 a month to watch TV. And we've got hundreds of channels and we'd never watch all of them anyway. And so friends, we said, okay, you know, 11 years ago, we, we done away with it. We said, forget that. Okay, we don't need it, okay? Do you need that new car? Well, okay, not really. Well, can you buy a nice used car? And I'll tell you what, they're just as expensive as the new ones are these days almost. Okay, really? Okay. Do you need a new car every two or three years? Well, yeah, no you don't. You really don't, my friend. Look, a lot of people, and you know, this is not a lesson on money management, but, but, I'll, but I'll tell you what, these questions that God is asking here are pertinent, and he's calling us to ask ourselves, why are we buying stuff that's not satisfying us? He says in verse 3, incline your ear and come, come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make, watch this, I will make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure mercies of David. Uh, he says, Behold, behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader, commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And the nations, now in the kingdom age, there'll be nations, plural, the nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God. And for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. So in the kingdom age, my friend, all nations of the earth are gonna flock to Israel. They're not doing that now. They're trying to run away from Israel. They're trying to run her into the Mediterranean Sea. But in that day, they're gonna flock to Israel. Why? Because of the Lord their God, okay? Now he tells us something that we need to pay very close attention to. I urge you to hear this message this morning. It is urgent. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Uh, so that implies one day he may not be near. That implies one day that he may not be found. And my friend, that's true. 
The Bible says, okay, not Job, but the Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And my friend, listen, now I love you. I'm going to say something this morning. Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. He did not say it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, purgatory. He didn't say it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, your loved ones can buy you out of hell. My friend, that is unscriptural this morning. When you die, it is over. You are sealed for eternity. If you have chosen Jesus as your personal Savior and you die in that condition, my friend, you'll go to heaven and you will never uh, leave there, my friend. You'll be there forever and forever. That's a great thing. But my friend, just the opposite is true. If you die without Jesus Christ, if you don't have your sins forgiven and washed away by the blood of Jesus, when you die, you'll go to a devil's hell and you will not leave it. My friend, the Bible teaches us in Luke 16 about a place called hell that men go to when they die without Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, the rich man, he's still there today, my friend, pleading and begging for just a drop of water to be put on his tongue because he said, I'm tormented in this flame. And, and, and my friend, uh, he's still there today, pleading and begging. He wanted someone to go and tell his brothers about this place. And Father Abraham said, no, they have Moses and the prophets. They've got the word of God. And uh, no, no, he says, if you send somebody and they testify of this place, if somebody comes back from the dead, they'll listen. And, and God says, no, that's not going to happen, my friend. He says, if you will not listen to the word of God, you won't be persuaded. If I, if I could bring someone into this room this morning to talk to you on this broadcast who's been in hell and try to convince you that hell is real, you wouldn't believe it, my friend. You wouldn't because the Bible is very clear. It's his word that you need to believe this morning. And I'm telling you, there's coming a day, my friend, where uh, he won't be around to call upon him because you'll be in eternity lost without God. And I'm going to tell you something. One of these days, one of these mornings, the day's going to start just like normal. You're going to get up. You're going to go to work, my friend. You're going to be up. You're going to be getting a shower, getting dressed. You're going to be going off to work, doing your thing. And all of a sudden, millions of people are going to disappear now, let's make it personal. You're going to be in your office one day, my friend. You've heard the message of Jesus over and over on this broadcast. You're going to be in your office working one day, and you're going to be having some co-workers around you, and all of a sudden, your secretary is going to disappear. Uh, your co-workers are going to disappear. Those who are saved, you know, those really loony people that try to tell you about Jesus, they're going to disappear one day. And where are they going to be? The rapture of, of the church has happened, and you will have missed it because you didn't trust Jesus as your Savior. You're going to be driving your car one day, my friend, and the car in front of you will be out of control. Why? Because the driver disappeared. And by the way, there'll be other cars around you that'll careen out of control, my friend, because those persons who were driving those cars were saved, and they were raptured when Jesus comes. And, and I tell you what, a driverless car at 55, 60 miles an hour is not a safe thing to be around. But that's what's going to happen, my friend. You might be in an airplane one day and flying somewhere to your next business trip or your next vacation spot. And Jesus is going to come. And you've heard the message and you refuse to re receive Jesus as your Savior. And all of a sudden, pilot's going to be gone. And you don't know how to fly, but guess what? Your plane will be pilotless. And friends, there'll be people in your plane that are around you, your neighbor, the one that's sitting next to you is going to disappear, going to be gone. Yes, there's coming a day, my friend, when he will not be around for you to call upon him. It'll be too late. It'll be too late. Listen, I urge you today, call upon him while he may be found. Call upon him when he's near. Verse 7, he says, let the wicked forsake his way. Repent of your sins. Trust Jesus as your Savior. That's what he's saying. Now notice this, and the unrighteous man, his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. My friend, listen, God will save you today. You say, well, Pastor Joe, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to know what you've done. Uh, I don't need to see your rap sheet, okay? It may be a mile long. It doesn't matter. Listen, the blood of Jesus can cleanse your sins. The God of heaven can pardon you today your sins can be forgiven. And how can he do that? Well, God is higher than us. He's different than we are. 
He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, uh, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For, notice this, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For, as the rain cometh down, and we had a, a bad rainstorm here last night. We've, we've had rain now for the past week here in Virginia. That's a good thing. Now watch this. As the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, uh, but water the earth, and maketh, maketh it bring forth and bud, and it may, um, <clears throat> and it may give seed, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So that's where your food comes from, okay? So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, God says. It, <clears throat> it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. That's what the Word of God does. It goes forth and it does its work. You see, that's why I teach the Word of God verse by verse, chapter by chapter here on verse by verse, because friends, I believe the Word of God is powerful and it will do the work it needs to do in your heart and my heart. Now watch this verse 12. For you shall go out, for you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in the singing and all the trees with the field shall clap their hands now that's not literally now uh, this is poetic and this speaks of creation in the kingdom age creation will be bright it'll be cheerful even the creation will demonstrate the glory of God in that day um, in, in uh, instead of thorns shall come up the fir tree so in that day, the curse will be lifted. There won't be any thorns anymore. There'll be trees. And instead of briars. Now, you know what a briar is. I tell you what. I've been in the field uh, as a boy. When we purchased some land in Louisiana, where I used to live in 1976, we moved out to the country. We lived on three acres of land. And as an eight-year-old boy, I was so excited. Oh, I live on a farm. I was. It, it wasn't a farm, but I thought it was. And on the first day we lived there, my dad tried to tell me, son, don't go out there. There's briars and thickets. You don't want to go out there. Let me clear it first, and you can play in the field all day. Well, of course, as an eight-year-old boy, I was fascinated by that. I wanted to be in the field. I wanted to be a farmer, and I got my boots on. I went out. And I went into the field, and sure enough, I got into the briar patch, and I'll tell you what. They hurt, okay, and he had to come and rescue me and get me out of that briar patch, bring me in. Well, in the kingdom age, there won't be any briars. Instead of briars shall come up, watch this, the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name and an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. It'll be forever and forever. Well, the next time we will pick up in Isaiah 56. And so let's end today by just simply asking you the question. Folks, I don't mean to be hard. I'm really not wanting to be hard, but listen, let me ask you a question today. If you were to die today, oh, now Pastor Joe, now come on now. I, I went to the doctor last week and he gave me a clean bill of health. I've got all my test results. Man, I'm as healthy as a horse. That's wonderful. I thank God for that. You know, at age 53, I'm in pretty good health. And I'm glad of that, you know? But listen, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? Listen, if Jesus were to come this morning, it's still early, my friend. You know what? It's still early. It's, um, let's see, where I'm at, it is 9.25 a.m. I'm getting, I'm just getting started early this morning. But listen, Jesus could come this morning. If he comes today, are you ready to meet the Lord? You say, Pastor Joe, how can I get ready? How can I know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die? Or if Jesus comes, well, it's really that simple. It's really simple. It's as simple as A, B, C. A, are you willing to admit to God? Just admit to God, God, I'm a sinner. God, I've broken your law. I've, I know I've done wrong. I've done those things that what you say is wrong. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. 
The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. None! Out of all the people living on the earth today, there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says that the wages of our sin is death. That's the sentence that God must pass upon man. But, uh-oh, Jesus walks in and says, Father, I'm going to die. I'm willing to take the price. Don't sentence him to death. You've already sentenced him. The sentence must be carried out, but I, I'm willing to die for the people. Jesus took my sins and took yours. He took our death on the cross. Do you believe that this morning? Are you willing to admit you're a sinner? If you are, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I do that, Pastor? You place faith in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. You believe on him. You put trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. And if you do believe that, then just simply call upon him. I invite you right, right where you are to just bow your head. Lord, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus as my Savior. Lord, would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? And you know, prayers don't save people. And I, I, I hesitate when I do this because, I, you know, I don't want you to file a prayer away just for... But some of you may not know how to talk to God and get saved but you know what it's just as simple as just asking God to save you telling him you're a sinner confessing your sins telling you you need to be saved and you know what he that cometh to me John 6 tells us I will in no wise cast out if you'll call upon him today and mean it he'll forgive you he'll save you give you a home in heaven he'll give you a new life and you can start living for him oh listen I know it's 2021 it's it's a modern era we're in the 20s of, of our generation but, but listen that old gospel as one evangelist I used to know still says today that old gospel still works get saved today trust the Lord as your personal savior and if you did get saved send me a message a private message if you want to or just a, a, a comment on the video say I trusted Christ my personal savior love to hear it or if you are saved if you're encouraged by the messages hey love to hear that too prayer requests whatever the case may be We'd love to hear about it. Okay, let's pray. Father, we come. Be with everyone that heard today. Lord, don't let anybody go to hell that heard the message today. And we thank you for what you're going to do. Encourage the believers, Lord. It's a crazy world we live in, but the kingdom age is coming. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, listen, I'll be on later in the week. And uh, we'll be in Isaiah 56. I think 56 and 57. I'm not sure, but we'll certainly be in 56. So God bless you until later in the week. Have a good week. Thank you.